Now, if you will, take out your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'd like for us to begin by reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 this evening. We're going to read the first seven verses. And we have already asked that God might bless the reading of His Word. But I think it is especially appropriate in light of these verses that we bear in mind, the very prayer that we offer every time we read Scripture in these assemblies or in our classes through the week, we ask that God's Spirit might be pleased to help us, to enable us to see clearly the truth of God that is being revealed in Scripture. And of course, we're going to be talking a good bit tonight in our lesson about why that is so necessary. And that is the very truth that Paul uh, develops for us here in this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. That is the word of the Lord. And it speaks very poignantly, powerfully, I think, to the very issue that we're considering together tonight. We are moving through our study of the major doctrines of Scripture as they are organized and summarized in the Westminster Confession of Faith. And tonight we are looking at paragraphs 4 and 5 of chapter 1. This was contained in the notes from last week. They are still available in the back. But we were not able to complete that material. And so we're now approaching paragraphs 4 and 5, taking these up and looking at the reasons that we have confidence in God's revelation, particularly that revelation as it is contained in Scripture. Let me read to you these two paragraphs from the Confession. Westminster Confession, chapter 1, points 4 and 5. The authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed depends not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it does abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. Yet, notwithstanding, our full assurance, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. Now, these two passages, it seems to me, the passage from God's word in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and then this summary of the same basic truth in these two paragraphs of the Westminster Confession, it seems to me every time I read these portions that if we just simply stopped and just were to meditate on what, in one case, Paul, and in a later historical context, the Westminster divines are saying, what they're communicating, we would all be wiser just for meditating with the help of the Holy Spirit on these truths. Because what I love about both of these readings, one from Scripture and one from a a, a confession of faith that summarizes Scripture, both of them are so concise. 
They, the, every, every phrase in these two readings is packed with significance. It has a huge amount of meaning. If we just go back to the text that we read from Scripture for just a moment. Look at what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians 4. He says in verse 5, We proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. That is the central proclamation of the gospel. That is the proclamation of gospel ministry. And he says, we ourselves are servants. We are bond servants for Jesus' sake. And then notice verse 6 and the way that it connects creation from the beginning with the new creation in Christ. He says, for it is, it is God who said... Let light shine out of darkness. The same God who said, let there be light, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Did you realize what he's saying? He had just said in the two verses prior to this that the gospel is indeed veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. And the reason it is not veiled in your life or in mine has nothing to do with us. It's not because of our honesty. It's not because of our humility. It's not because of our own morality. It's not because of how religious we are. It is because the same God who in the very beginning of time, as we measure it, said, let there be light. The same God has said in our lives, let there be light. In our hearts, let there be light. And the light is Christ. And he has caused the light of the knowledge of the glory of God seen in the face of Jesus Christ to shine into our sin darkened hearts. That's just I mean, that's a that's a phrase you could just meditate on the rest of your life and probably still just sit in awe of it at the end of your life. What is the gospel? It is the light of the knowledge of what of God's glory. Where is it seen in Jesus Christ in the face of of Jesus Christ. Moses' face shines, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Jesus' face shines with an eternal, unchanging, unfading glory. And that is the glory that has shone into our hearts, darkened by sin. Now, what does that have to do with this part of the Westminster Confession that we are looking at together tonight? Well, paragraphs 4 and 5 talk about the confidence that we have that the Bible is indeed God's Word written. Remember that, that phrase from, from paragraph, uh, uh, paragraphs 2 and 3 that we looked at last week? The Word of God written. It is the Word of God written down. And when we hear the Bible read, we are hearing God speak. God Himself speak in Scripture. Well, how, how do we have that confidence? Well, the basis for our confidence, the confession says, is not the testimony of any man. And it is not the testimony of any church we receive it because it is God's word. Now, this may seem like a circular argument. And we're going to have some things to talk about tonight with regard to circularity, probably. But, uh, but this may seem like a circular argument. But this is the reality of any absolute, ultimate truth claim. It's interesting that this afternoon I was here at the office doing some work. And when I'm doing work that I don't have to pay much attention to, I background listen to other sermons and usually religious debates or lectures or things like that. And I was listening to the, to the latter part of a debate that I'd started over the last week or so. It was a debate recently held in Southern California at Branch of Hope OPC Church during the Bonson Conference. It was a debate about the existence of God. It's a really interesting debate. And, uh, and one of the speakers gave a beautiful illustration, I thought, of this very principle that we're talking about tonight. He said, imagine that you walk into the room, that I walk into the room and I say, I am the strongest man on earth. And you would, of course, say, after you finished laughing, right, you would say, prove it. But what sense would it make for me to say I'm the strongest man on earth and you say prove it, but then you to, to, that you demand prove it without using your strength? Well, how could you do that? Well, you couldn't. Because what we have there is an ultimate and absolute claim. I am the strongest man on the earth. How am I going to prove an ultimate absolute claim? Without exercise, every time, every time, one of my friends who's an atheist wants to talk about truth, he takes out his Bible 
and he uses his Bible to explain why he believes what he believes is true. Now, of course, he doesn't call his Bible his Bible. He calls it science. Or he calls it logic. Or he calls it reason. Right? But that is his standard of authority. And I say, how do you know that, that logic is logical? How do you know that reason is reasonable? How do you know that what you think is true actually is true? Well, for the Christian, the Christian comes and says, this is what the word of God says. Well, why do you believe that's the word of God? Because fundamentally, that's what it is. It would be like me saying, I'm the strongest man on earth. And if it were actually true, which is the farthest thing from the truth, right? But if it were actually true, I would say, because I'm the strongest man on earth. That's, that's why I can say that is because it is what it is. Fundamentally, the reason that we as Christians believe that the Bible is the word of God is because that's what it is. It's, it is the word of God. It's the word of God written. And you may say, but that's completely illogical. That's completely circular. No, it's not fundamentally, not in the way that we talk about reasoning in a circle where we are, are just working around the question. We're begging the question rather than actually evidencing the question. But we'll have more to say about that tonight. What's important at this point is to say that the Bible has authority because of what it is. And it doesn't matter whether you recognize that or not. This is like every natural law that is in fact a law and unbreakable. Right? The law of gravity is what it is. You don't have to acknowledge it. You don't have to know what it is. You can even choose to defy it. It will assert its authority because it's true. You say, well, but we can, we can defy the law of gravity successfully. No, you can't. No, you can't. An airplane gets off the ground not by breaking the law of gravity, but by availing itself of other natural laws, natural principles that allow it to have lift, right? But guess what? When it stops taking advantage of those other natural principles in nature, guess what's going to happen? The law of gravity is going to assert itself, right? See, the word of God, if in fact it is the word of God, has authority by the very fact of its existence. And you can say, I don't, I don't know whether it's the word of God, and that's fine. We can have that conversation. When I study with a person who is an atheist or an agnostic, I do not immediately ask them to take for granted the divine authority of the Bible. I do ask them to start reading the Bible with me. But I don't ask them to accept that it is, in fact, the word of God. But here's the reality. It is the word of God. And that's one of the reasons why I have such great confidence that if they begin listening to the word of God written, God may be pleased through the reading of that word to produce the faith that he says it will indeed produce. If the Bible is God's word, we have to accept it. And, and whether you agree with it or not is completely irrelevant. If it is the word of God, then that's the end of the discussion. That's the end of the matter. This is why it is so important in the context of the local church that when we're talking about how things ought to be done, what the church ought to look like, what the church ought to believe, what the church ought to teach, those are not matters for public debate. Those are matters for public study. For public teaching, for public confessing. But the day that the church decides that it can decide what it's going to believe or what it's going to teach based on the congregation's assent or dissent from particular scriptural propositions is the day the church stops being the church. It becomes apostate. Uh, many of you have probably seen, and some of you at some point in time may have had one on your car, that was very popular a decade or so ago where people would have a bumper sticker on their car and they would say, the, you know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. The problem is the bumper sticker is too long, right? If God said it, that's it. It settles it. It doesn't matter whether you accept it or not. Now, you should accept it, right? And it certainly is in the best interest of your soul to accept it. But do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying and what the Westminster Confession is affirming is that the authority of Scripture is objective. It is objective and absolute. It is what it is. There's none of this postmodern silliness where I can say to you or you can say to me, well, what's true for you is true for you, but it may not be true for me. 
Folks, if this is the word of God, then it's the word of God. And if it's the word of God, then it is true. If it's not God's word, then yes, we can sit in judgment on it. And I don't if it's not God's word, I don't really know why we're even bothering being here. I, I, I absolutely I cannot fathom why professing Christians who deny the full inspiration, authority, and inerrancy of God's word. Why they bother professing to be Christians at all. Uh, it, it does, it, uh, that doesn't compute with me. Now, I know they have their reasons. I have many friends like that. But nevertheless, it doesn't follow for me. If it's God's word, then it should be able to speak authoritatively into our lives. If it's not God's word, what does it matter? What, is it, what do we care, right? Put your Bible away and we'll do something else with our lives. If the Bible is God's word, literally and actually, then it can't be mistaken in anything that it affirms. Notice in anything that it affirms. This, this conversation and question in, in modern evangelicalism about the inerrancy of the Bible is, is unfortunate. It's a, it's, it comes across to people as if it's a very complicated, as a very complex question. Well, is the Bible inerrant? In other words, free of historical error. Does it affirm anything that is mistaken or not fully true? Did the, did the biblical writers write with the limitations of their own historical point in time? Or did the, were they carried along by the Holy Spirit and affirm that which is true? Always in all places and for all times. Well, if you understand the doctrine of inspiration, if you understand what the Westminster Confession has been unpacking over these last four paragraphs, then inerrancy is a non-issue. If it is God's word, God cannot lie. Therefore, his word cannot affirm anything that is untrue. Otherwise, God would have lied. And so, yes, it's inerrant. Now, does the Bible contain mistakes? Well, of course it does. It quotes Job's friends. There are a whole lot of bad theology in those debates, right? And I've heard Christians quote a portion of those debates, quoting Job's friend as if it were biblical truth. And you say, well, that's an accurate quote, but that's not truth that God is affirming. That's truth that an objector is affirming. You've got to be able to make those distinctions. And yes, can copies of the Bible have mistakes in it? Of course they can. The same way that an English text that's run off of a printing press or however they do it today, right? As in the same way that that text could be corrupted, how much more when a text has been copied by hand? Yes, copies can have mistakes in them. But when we talk about what the Bible affirms to be true, is it the word of God? Then it's inerrant. If it's not the word of God, then all bets are off, right? We can have absolutely no confidence in it at all. Unless it is, in fact, the word of God. Scripture's authority does not depend upon man's testimony or the church's endorsement. Because, as the confession says here in paragraph 4, it depends wholly upon God, parenthesis, who is truth itself. Did you notice that? God is truth itself. God is true. And are you going to say that God is true, but what he has said in Scripture, some of it's not true? Now, who's being illogical? Who's being inconsistent? We're saying God, who is the truth itself, has spoken in Scripture, which is his word written down. And if God is true, then it is true. If God cannot lie, then it cannot lie. If God cannot make mistakes, then it is not mistaken. Period. And that's ultimately why we accept the authority of Scripture. If God said it, then it is true, no matter what you or I think about it. Now, take up your Bible for a minute. I want to show you a few verses that demonstrate the, the, the epistemology, if you will, of Scripture. Epistemology, we said last week, is just studying knowledge. Where does knowledge come from? What is knowledge, really? I mean, how do we know what we know? How can we know how to know what we know? Well, look at Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 22. I'm going to run through just a few verses very quickly here. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 22. In the Bible, you have what in modern philosophy is referred to as the correspondence theory. And that is truth is what corresponds to reality. Right? 
I believe that I am standing here on a platform right now on my own two feet. I'm wearing a sweater vest that I bought at Goodwill and I'm wearing a jacket that at this point in the evening is extremely hot. That's what, and that happens to correspond to reality, therefore that's what is true. Well look at the way that that is developed in the, in the language of scripture. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Now, how do you know whether the person who claims to speak in the name of the Lord is in fact speaking with the authority of God or not? It's whether it comes to pass. It's whether it comes true. If the prophet says, thus and so says the Lord, thus and so is going to happen, and thus and so doesn't happen, then he says, that's not from God. Now, the presupposition here is that God could not make a mistake. That prophet could come back later and he could say, well, that was what God said, but then God changed his mind. You know, he does that a lot. In... No, he doesn't, right? Well, that is what God said, but then he, he turns out that he was mistaken about that. It wasn't going to be then, it was going to be some le... And that's what modern prophets, so to speak, do a lot, don't they? They'll make a prediction, and then if it doesn't come to pass, then they will, they'll, they'll change their ideas here. Well, maybe we misunderstood, maybe we misinterpreted this, maybe we didn't, didn't get this part of it right. That the Lord did not send him. <laughs> the Lord did not give him that message. Because how do you know what is of God? It's correspondence to the truth. Look at Pro, or Psalm 18. rather, Psalm 18 and verse 30. This is one of David's psalms that he wrote in the aftermath of his victories. Won by God's grace. Psalm 18 and verse 30. This God, David says, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. You notice how what he said, God, God's way is perfect. Therefore, what does his word do? It proves true. It proves true in a moment in time. You take a slice in time at any moment in time. People are going to quibble with portions of God's word. There are a lot of things in Scripture that are very unpopular in an unregenerate uh, society, right? And so people are going to look at that portion of God's Word and they're going to attack it. But guess what? If it is God's Word, then over time, what is going to become apparent? That it's true. It's going to prove itself to be true. Now, the problem is, for many people who reject the Word of God, the day it's going to prove true is the day that they bow their knee and their tongues confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but they will do so to their eternal damnation rather than to their eternal salvation. That next passage on the handout should be Proverbs chapter 30, not Psalm. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Doesn't, doesn't that capture this idea? Every word of God proves true. Not just some of them, not just most of them. People debate and discuss this and they say, well, maybe, maybe the, the statements about Jesus' death and resurrection are true. But of course, you cannot believe that he fed 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish. And I say, which is harder to believe? That Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, and rose the third day, or that he multiplied bread and fish and fed a multitude. I would say that the feeding of the 5,000 is much easier to believe than the resurrection of Christ. If the feeding of the 5,000 is off the table, everything's off the table. You're telling me that you accept the resurrection of Jesus, but you don't accept other miracles in the canon of Scripture? Seriously? Every word of God proves true. And you will either be the person who takes refuge in that truth or you will be the person who is exposed by that truth. Do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found to be a liar. God is not going to be exposed as a liar. But you or I will be when we take liberties with the word of God. And then one more passage, John chapter 3 and verse 33. John chapter 3 and verse 33, here I believe uh, uh, John is giving some commentary uh, in the aftermath first of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus and then John the Baptist's conversation uh, 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 that, that resulted over the question of purification. 
John the Baptist's disciples rather coming to Jesus about that. And so John, the writer of the fourth gospel here, is giving some commentary on this. He says, verse 33, whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. That is the impact, that is the import of accepting Jesus's message. What you are saying, if you confess belief in Jesus Christ, is that God is true. Not just that God exists, that God is true. Right? God is, state of being verb, true. He is the truth. The Greek word most often translated truth in the New Testament is a word that could be translated just as easily reality. God is real. God is genuine. God is authentic. You say you believe what Jesus said. What you are saying, what you are accepting is that God is reality. This correspondence theory, right? The Word of God corresponds to reality. The Word of God, whether you can see everything tangibly, materially, touch it, taste it, smell it, whatever, whether you can see that or not, it is true. And therefore it has authority because it is in fact the Word of God. If you think you can pick and choose what you want to believe from the Bible, you're an unbeliever. And let me say, there are a lot of professing Christians who may be right in professing faith about Jesus, but they're picking and choosing within Scripture. You're behaving like an unbeliever. That's what a non-Christian does. It's not an option for the Christian. Many people believe in God. Very few people believe God. And there is a difference. And you cannot have one without the other. You cannot say, I believe in God, I believe in Christ, but I don't believe what he said about this or that. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. And and I want want you to understand here, maybe a, a little pastoral caveat here, lest I drop that hammer a little too hard. You can have questions about what God has said. I'm not suggesting that from the moment a person comes to faith, they ought to have the attitude or ever have the attitude that they have it all figured out. Well, that's not what we're saying. You can have questions about what God has said. You can come to passages and say, I'm not sure how to understand what the Lord has said here. I'm not sure how to interpret what Scripture says here. I'm not sure how to apply that in my life. But I accept that it is the Word of God. And therefore... Whatever it says, whenever I understand it, I'm going to believe it and obey it. I believe it without even understanding it right now. I just want to understand it so that I can know what it is that I believe. Right? That's the attitude. And so when I talk about picking and choosing, I'm not talking about having legitimate questions about the text. I'm not talking about having even legitimate interpretive debates and discussions within the family, the body of Christ. I'm talking about people who say, I can be a Christian, I can believe in God, and I don't like this part of the Bible, and therefore I reject that. That may be true for you, it's not true for me. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Now let's go back, as long as we're here in John, to chapter 10. Where we read from this morning before the Lord's Supper. Let's look at John chapter 10 for a moment. We're going to read a little bit more of an extended pericope here. Paragraph, sorry. Um, Because at this point, the confession, the Westminster Confession of Faith gets into a fairly controversial topic. But one on which I think the Bible's teaching is actually pretty clear. If we can just set aside the emotion uh, and the presuppositions that we have about how this ought to work and simply listen to Jesus describe how it does, in fact, work. Let's go to John chapter 10 and verse 24. It says, so the Jews gathered around Jesus and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Seems like a reasonable request, right? I mean, Jesus has been pretty vague up till now, don't you think? Not so much. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Now they made a reasonable request, right? Tell us plainly, are you the Christ? No cloaked in parables, no cloaked in no, nothing, no figures of speech. Just tell us plainly. And if you are, then we'll believe. And Jesus says it doesn't work that way. And he tells them plainly, this is who I am and this is who you are. And verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Now, there are many ways in which we can argue with unbelievers for the reasonableness of believing in God, believing in Christ, believing that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead, that the miracles attributed to Christ in Scripture are in fact true. There are many arguments that can be made for the inspiration and authenticity of Scripture. You notice here in the confession in paragraph 5, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture. I mean, it's not like you have to rule that out. It's not like you can't pay attention to the fact that for 2,000 years, the church has believed this is the Word of God. That carries some weight, right? That's, that's significant evidence. What about the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof. All of these are arguments whereby it does abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. Sounds like a Josh McDowell book. I mean, seriously, it, it's giving all of these arguments. And saying, look at the fact, the unity of the Bible, the profound influence of the Bible, the coherence of the Bible, the non-contradictory nature of the Bible's testimony, having been written over a period of 1,500 years by perhaps as many as 40 different authors on three different continents, and yet all of it points to one story. It ultimately climaxes in Christ. That has to be the work of God. And I would say, amen. Absolutely. Here's the problem. Yet, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. Now, what is, what is the confession saying there? The confession is saying there are many beautiful, wonderful, reasonable, historical evidences that you can muster in favor of the authority of Scripture and the Christian faith in general. And that ultimately is not why you believe in Jesus. And it's not why I believe in Jesus. And it's not why you believe that the Bible is God's word. And maybe why you think you believe in Jesus. Because, praise God, the Lord works through means, right? And it may be that you came to faith through someone walking you through these kind of arguments. But you know what ultimately turned the light switch on? You know, ultimately, the God who said in the beginning, let there be light, said, let the light of Jesus shine into your heart. You know what ultimately accomplished that? It was the Holy Spirit bearing witness with and by the word. It was the Holy Spirit. It wasn't the arguments that reasoned you into the kingdom of God. It was the Holy Spirit who did that. Now, come back here to John 10. Look at what Jesus is saying. You've got Jews gathering around with what seems like such a reasonable question. How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. If you pluck that request out of context and listen to that, you say, these are honest people. These are seekers of truth. But then you go back and you read the first nine and a half chapters of the book of John and you say, no, they're not. They're a bunch of liars. These are the ones that Jesus himself said in John chapter 8, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father is all that you want to do. They're the ones in John chapter 5, he said, are so dishonest that when they read scripture, they can't even see the fact that Moses is testifying against them in scripture. And now here in John 10, they say, oh, you know, don't leave us in doubt. You know, we are willing to believe if we just had the answers that we need. And Jesus says, no, that's not true. No, that's not true. Verse 25, I told you and you do not believe. Do you remember what Nicodemus says? The beginning of John chapter 3. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus by night and says, Teacher, we know that you have come from God, for no one can do the works that you do unless God is with him. 
It's amazing how a late night conversation produces honesty, right? The, 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 there's nobody else around, there's nothing at stake, and there's this acknowledgement. There's only one way to explain the ministry of Jesus Christ, and that is that He is Jesus Christ, not just Jesus of Nazareth. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Jesus says, I've already answered this question. Asked and answered. That's not the issue. You don't believe. That's the problem. And why don't you believe? He says, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. You are... Now, this, if it were written by much of the modern evangelical church, this verse would be written in reverse. You are not among my sheep because you don't believe. If you would just believe, then you could be part of Jesus' flock. But you're not part of the flock because you don't believe. Jesus says it the other way. He says, you don't believe because you're not part of my flock. You're not among my sheep. Have you, are you paying attention to the way that that verse is written? It makes a difference, folks. See, the danger is that you and I begin to think, well, we got here because we have good and honest hearts. You know, I'm a reasonable person. I'm an honest person. I'm an humble person. And that's 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 why I'm here and why all of those other people that I thank God I'm not like are out there. Right. I, God, I thank you that I'm not like those men. That's that's what we begin to think. And we begin to think I'm part of Christ's body. I'm part of the flock of God because because I believe. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You believe because you're part of the flock. But I thought I became part of the flock by believing. He says, no. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Here's the reality, folks. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit into the world after his ascension back into heaven to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And you and I are not the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we don't do evangelism? No. On the contrary, it means we actually have power to do evangelism. Because now I don't have to go out into the unbelieving community and feel like anything ultimately depends on me. I better get this right. I better be at my most persuasive. I better have an answer for every argument that they make. Because if, if I don't, then they may go to hell because of my incompetence. Seriously. And yet that's the way that Christians torment themselves thinking about evangelism. And Jesus says, you're not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts the world concerning sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. Now the reality is, I, I talk to unbelievers every week, practically every day of every week. I am sharing the gospel with somebody in some context. And when I do that, I want to do that faithfully. I want to do that clearly. I want to present the best argument that I can for the Christian faith. And yet, and yet, if you and I are reading scripture correctly, then we should understand that it's the Holy Spirit who convicts sinners. It's the Holy Spirit who converts sinners. And it's ultimately the work of God to shine the light into a person's heart. And I don't care how effective you are as an evangelist, how eloquent you are, how, how well you argue the, the case for Christ. You can, you can be eloquent and persuasive and share the gospel with someone and they're utterly unfazed, utterly unmoved. Another person goes to someone else and makes a complete mess of it. The most ineloquent, incoherent presentation of the gospel you could imagine. And suddenly there are tears streaming down the person's face. And they're saying, my Lord and my God, I trust in Jesus. I give my life to the Lord. And you say, that's just not fair. It's not how that's supposed to work. And God says, that's exactly how it works. That's how, that's how you got where you are. That's all of us. You see, the world is asking the question... How long will you keep us in suspense? Just tell us plainly. And Jesus is saying that actually is not the issue. The issue is that ever since the fall, human minds and human wills have been bent against God. And like the Jews in Jesus' day, we're of our father, the devil, and the desires of our father is what we want to do. And we continue in sin apart from Christ because that's what we enjoy doing. 
It's the passing pet pleasures of sin. Yeah, they're passing, but they are pleasurable, right? And we keep choosing sin because we want to sin. And we reject the truth because we don't want the truth. We, we hate the light. Greg Bonson said in his book, Presuppositional Apologetics, quote, We defend a genuine system of authority that cannot be known except by divine revelation. This inscripturated word from God stands in judgment over all and is itself judged by no one. The submission to this authoritative revelation is caused not by impudent reasoning, but by the Holy Spirit. God's word is perfectly rational. However, it is not the autonomous, that means self-governing, self-ruling. It is not the autonomous, rational man who receives it, but the humble man who knows better than to subject the sovereign Lord's prerogatives to an independent test for verification at the overriding bar of human intellect, end quote. Now that last part of the quote may be difficult for you to process in a short amount of time, but, but this, is the, this is the sense of it. This is the basic essence of it. A person who comes to believe in Jesus Christ fundamentally has to submit themselves to the authority of God's Word. Not sit in judgment over God's Word. And then finally determine, okay, you've sufficiently made your case, now I'll climb down from the judge's seat and allow you to sit in it. Right? Uh, we've got to be careful here with some charts that have been drawn over the years. Right? Where we've got the Christian who's still on the throne and Jesus is at his feet. So there is no such Christian in the Bible. Now, there are Christians who act like that's the case. I'm not denying that Christians sometimes behave in carnal ways. What I'm saying is there is no such Christian in Scripture. There is no Christian that has himself on the throne and Jesus at his feet. It's the opposite because we're dealing with objective realities. We're not talking about whether you agree with the word of God or not. We're talking about the fact that the Bible is the word of God and therefore what he says is true. If persuasive rhetoric or rationality were sufficient by themselves to produce faith, don't you think that Jesus would have converted these people in John chapter 10? I mean, isn't he the Lord? <laughs> right? Couldn't he do that? Don't you think that if just persuasive argumentation, eloquent rhetoric were sufficient by itself to produce faith, wouldn't Jesus have convinced everybody that he ever met? When he left the world, wouldn't everybody that he ever talked to have been a Christian? But that is not the case. Far from it. Most did not accept Jesus' preaching, and most still do not today. And the reason, Jesus says, is because they are not of his sheep. Go over to Acts chapter 13 for a moment. Look at the way that the same thing plays out in Paul's ministry. Did my watch that's going faster tonight? Or? I don't know. I didn't think we'd taken that long. Okay, we'll move along here. Acts 13. Paul is in Antioch of Pisidia. It's on the first preaching journey, right? He's up in the southern region of Galatia, what's now modern Turkey. Listen to what happens. Verse 46 of Acts 13. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves of unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us saying, I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. The Jews are rejecting the gospel. Paul says, fine. You've judged yourselves to be unworthy of ever everlasting life, eternal life. Who proves themselves unworthy of life? The sinner who rejects the word of God. That's, we get all of the credit for that. All of the credit for rejecting God. But notice verse 48. Who gets the credit when someone believes? And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. You notice how that's stated in a passive form? As many as appointed themselves? No. As many as were appointed. By who? The Lord. Jesus says in John 10, some of you don't believe because you're not my sheep. And here in Acts 13, some believed because they were his sheep. We say, well, how do you know who is who? Well, here's how you know. You preach the word. The ones that believe are his. The ones that don't are not. Now, what we hope and what we pray and what we will continue to do until those people who reject the word die is we will continue to present the word of God to them, hoping and praying that it is God's good pleasure for them to receive the word at a later point. And many times it is. 
I dare say most of us who accept the gospel do not do so the first time we hear it. But fundamentally, those who are Christ are known by their responsiveness to his word. And that is the work that we are relying upon. J.V. Fesco in his commentary on the Westminster Confession said, quote, The power of raw or unregenerate reason does not convince the reader of Scripture's authority, only the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit's work of effectual calling. End quote. Let me read you a quotation from someone else. C.S. Lewis, God in the Dock. This gets to the heart of the matter. Now, Lewis is here making an observation that he does not find as troubling as, as I would find it. He's just observing the reality that in a modern context, this is mid-20th century Western civilization, that things have changed in terms of evangelism and apologetics. Listen to what he says. The ancient man approached God, or even the gods, as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He, the modern man, is the judge. God is in the dock. He, the modern man, is quite a kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war, poverty, and disease, he, the modern man, is ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal. But the important thing is that man is on the bench and God in the dock. Now, we don't use the term dock in American jurisprudence, right? But we would say God is at the defendant's table, right? He is the accused. An unsaved man is the judge. Now, Lewis is not lamenting that. He's just observing that. But I would say that's lamentable, right? That's not how it works, folks. God is not on trial. And God is not to be judged by an unsaved person. I mean, can you imagine the audacity of that? Right? Can you imagine? We don't have anything in our world's experience to compare that to. Right? But the audacity of an unregenerate creature saying to the Creator, prove yourself to me. Answer for the immorality of your actions. And if you have a reasonable excuse, I may choose to acquit you. Who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? Do you remember when Job tries this, right? When Job is having this conversation with his friends and he keeps saying, if I just had an audience with the Lord, if I could just bring my case before him. Now he's recognizing God as the judge, but he's convinced that his arguments are so good that he would persuade God. And you remember at the end of the book where God shows up and says, Job, you know, there was this thing where Satan showed up and I kind of enticed him a little bit to tempt you. And, and that was what I'm so sorry about. Do you remember that part? of the, I don't remember that part either right? because it's not in the story. Now, at the end of the book of Job, God shows up and says, who is this who darkens counsel without knowledge? Who is this who questions God? Dress yourself like a man. Prepare yourself. I will speak. You'll answer my questions. And then God starts asking questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I established the boundaries of the sea? Where were you when I threw the stars across space and called every one of them by name? Where were you again? At the end of it, Job says, I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke of things that I did not understand. And that's what every single one of us is going to do on the last day. We're going to shut our mouths and, and, and simply fall on our faces before a holy God. There's a lot more we could say about this. Let me just kind of make a couple of closing observations and then you can follow the breadcrumbs in the notes. Tonight, what I am saying is that we need to approach evangelism and apologetics and we need to approach the question of Scripture's authority with this understanding that Scripture is, in fact, the word of God. Now, tonight you may be here and you may say, I don't I don't believe that it is the word of God. That's fair. We can have a conversation about that. But what I am saying is if you're here and you're a Christian, you don't have the luxury. You don't have the option of saying that. Because you can't be a Christian and deny that the Bible is God's word. If you're a Christian, then you believe that God is true. And if you believe that God is true, then you have to believe that his word is true. And that means what it says is true. And it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, accept it or not. It's just what is. It is reality. 
And so when we approach questions about the authority of Scripture, we do not approach those questions on the defensive. Trying to make an appeal to an unregenerate person somehow coax them into accepting the authoritative word of heaven. No, this is the truth. This is the reality. And you will either recognize that reality and live in the light of it or you will be smashed upon it. Those are the only two possibilities. This is gravity. You are either going to recognize that gravity is and it's real or it will assert its authority on your person and you will pay the penalty. You don't approach this from a defensive standpoint because the word of God fundamentally is God's word and therefore doesn't really need that kind of defense. (laughs) Now, Acts chapter 17, which last year I think it was, Jacob did a great job of kind of unpacking two or three episodes in Acts 17, showing how we reason from the scriptures with those who have some prior commitment to it, like the Jews in Thessalonica. And we reason from natural revelation with the pagans, like those that Paul appealed to in the city of Athens at the end of Acts chapter 17. Yes, we should debate. Yes, we should reason. Yes, we should present arguments. It it is completely legitimate. To present evidence and to to persuade men. But fundamentally we have to bear in mind what Paul admonishes Timothy with in saying that the servant of the Lord must not quarrel but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition if God perhaps will grant them repentance. And that's fundamentally what it comes down to. We do not convert people, we cannot, only the Spirit of God can. We need a biblical view of the human condition and realize that we are not attempting to persuade neutral people. We are reasoning with those who are in rebellion against the God who is there, the God who has spoken and who is not silent. And evidence and arguments are not worthless. They are tools. They have an important role. By the way, there is a profound difference between what I'm talking about tonight and what's known as fideism, where basically we just kind of like the the Mormon church, the Latter-day Saints will say, I've prayed the prayer in Moroni chapter 10. I have a burning in the bosom. Therefore, I know that it's real. And you say, "But, but it doesn't correspond in any way, shape or form to history. To reality, it's full of contradiction. There are all kinds of problems with what you feel like you know, and you say, Well, but I I just know that's not at all what I'm suggesting that we do. God is not saying you check your brain at the door, but what He is saying is the reason you're able to use your brain and reasoning about these things is because I made it and gave it to you. So understand what evidence and arguments are and what they're not, what they can do and what they cannot. And recognize that God's reality and the truthfulness of his word do not depend upon our judgment or approval. And if you disapprove of what God says in his word, well, it's interesting, but it's largely irrelevant. Because if it is God's word, then that settles the question. Let's bow and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of a God such as you are, such as you have revealed yourself to be. Holy, righteous, just, truthful, and perfect in every attribute that you possess. God, we pray that tonight your spirit would work through the word that we've reflected on this evening and reassure our confidence yet again That your word indeed is truth. And we pray that you would sanctify us by your word. And strengthen our hands and our hearts for bearing witness to the truth of scripture in the face of an evil and unbelieving generation. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would prepare the hearts of men. That your spirit would go before us. So that as the gospel is preached, the spirit might work with and through that word to produce the very faith that will bring forgiveness of sins to the saving of the soul. Lord, help your word to do its work in each of our lives, in our families, in our homes, in this church, and in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.